we we do have some some social media not very social but some social uh uh we are at singapore css on twitter so if you do the tweeting thing you can tweet uh hashtag talk css and yes we magically through no effort of ourselves got like 300 <coughs> followers which is like yeah. amazing well done Why? sir well done <laughs> anyway yeah okay so um as long we as they, have as long as there aren't more Singapore CSS followers that I have, I'm okay. Or oh, whatever. <laughs> so if you're joining us for the first time, we um, have a guitar chat, which is like online 24-7 because most of us don't like to do our day jobs. We would rather help you solve your CSS problem. So if you post your CSS problem in the middle of the day, someone is going to reply you because like I said, we don't like to do our day jobs. Uh, we have a budget of zero dollars, so we are hosted on GitHub.io. Thank you, GitHub. Uh, that we and but but we do have a uh, slightly designed website. So if you are interested, and the website just recaps like all the talk CSSs that we've had uh, over the year. Uh, okay, we have shoutouts. So normally it's three logos. Uh, this month only have like two and a half because uh, ng we built dot sg which used to be the like the location where people go to find out about meetups, stack meetups in Singapore has now been um, swallowed. So, swallowed? <laughs> Should we say so? No, they're now parked under uh, engineers.sg and engineers.sg um, represented by that lovely gentleman in the black t-shirt looking very busy at the back. Engineers.sg helps to record almost every single tech meetup in Singapore like as best they can. It's a entirely volunteer run team effort and they are also recording us tonight so we want to thank you engineers.sg we also always want to thank Gion he, he usually comes sometimes he don't come but he is like the he is the swag king of Singapore so he prints t-shirt print sticker print prints anything that can be printed I think he printed socks recently mm -hmm. for PHPcom so we always want to shout out uh, Chion because uh, the first batch of these Singapore CSS stickers printed by Chion. So we always shout, shout, shout out to him even though he's not here. Um, moving on. Host of the month is Hackerspace. So we want to thank Hackerspace and uh, Luther who is hosting us this evening uh, for this lovely venue. Uh, nice projector, good aircon, fast internet. Thank you, Hackerspace. <laughs> And we have this thing called CSS Color of the Month. If you've been here before, I'm going to repeat myself again for the 20th time. There are 148 named CSS colors. So that's enough for like 12 years worth of talk, uh, talk CSS, which we don't think will last 12 years. Yeah, because we probably won't last 12 years. Uh, so <laughs> the color of this month is Peru. What this means is that you can use the word Peru in your CSS and this color will show up. You don't have to do the hex code, but if you want, you can use the hex code CD85. 3F or the RGBA, but Peru works just fine. So you can, CSS you can save color of all the those char characters, like three characters less, your wrist will get a bit less tired, you'll go home a little bit with more energy. Yeah, and okay, Choose Peru. so it's kind of a chocolatey uh, brown color, so if you are feeling like dessert, Peru. <laughs> uh, moving on. Okay, we will, if anybody has announcements, we'll leave that to the end. This is the segment that everybody who joins is forced to sit through. It's called HTML and CSS news for the month. Uh, if I'm not here, it doesn't happen. But because I'm here, unfortunately, it has to happen. Um, so the news for August is that Firefox 62 stable was released. And in this release, uh, a few updates to the dev tools. Uh, Firefox dev tools, I think most of us, the, do, does everybody use Firefox or most people use Chrome? Chrome? I saw someone already saying. The rest of you just pretend you all don't use DevTools. Fine. But anyway, <coughs> if you never tried Firefox DevTools, um, it's actually much improved from even just a year ago. So they have things, the, it has the best grid, CSS grid inspector tool. So if you do a CSS layout and you want to use grid, right, advise to use the Firefox uh, inspector. But even their JavaScript side of DevTools has become a uh, uh, much better like recently the update they pushed for 63 is that there's like uh, syntax highlighting in the console and things like that so it's kind of cool even though like people keep using Chrome's dev tools I think should give Firefox a chance shape path editor is available by default because there's this CSS property called CSS shapes that allows your text to flow around various shapes uh, one of these days I will talk about it again uh, but it is now enabled by default in the stable version of Firefox which is great uh, Grid Inspector has updated features like I mentioned, so if you do want to try 
if you already use Grid or you want to start using Grid, right, really try out the uh, uh, Firefox's dev tools. A lot of CSS specification updates. So part of this uh, monthly update is I will talk about CSS specifications that got updated. I won't go into detail about them. It's just to inform you all that these CSS specifications exist so that you have sort of heard of it before. So when the time comes that you need to use a particular thing, you like vaguely, I think I heard that weird lady in the blue t-shirt talk about it before. And uh, then maybe you'll go and Google and then go and find out more. But you know, you, you, so there, there are now all the CSS is broken into modules and they are updated um, piece by piece. Because last time in CSS2, it was like one huge 500 page uh, document and it was actually quite tedious to update, to maintain and, and stuff like that. So now they've split it up, right? It makes it, it's much easier for maintainability and readability also. So um, there's actually an uh, entire specification for overflow, which is it handles the display of excessive amount of content in an element. So what happens when your container is too small for the amount of content you want to put in? So the browser needs to handle this sort of situation. So all, all, all those the, the algorithms are, are defined in this overflow spec. Working draft recently just got updated. Inline layout working draft. So what happened is that in CSS2, right, the, v, the entire chapter 9 of CSS2 was dedicated to like display. Uh, it was quite a very lengthy chapter, but it covered, at the time when CSS came out, there were only basically two layout modes, it's like block and inline. But um, as of now, we have uh, additional two more, we have flex and grid, and potentially we may, may or may not have more also. So they decided to split each of these layout modes into their own like section. So inline layout mode now has its own section, um, it's defined in layout tree, so it's for, it covers all the elements that are laid out in line, default display in line. So things like initial letter. So I don't think a lot of people have actually used initial letter. Basically you are you can style your text. Like if you have a if you're writing a bit of long form prose, right? You can make the first letter like those manuscripts very really, like illuminated kind. You can do that like with the pseudo element in like initial letter so all these defined inside inline layout uh grid layout level 2 has been updated so grid came out last year and there was a section of it that got deferred because they couldn't decide on like algorithmically how the browser was supposed to handle it as sub grid basically whether you can have relationships between the children of the grid so i think there was a lot of contention about how it's going implemented so they just cut the whole section release grid as level one first and then try to deliberate this again so i think this is chugging along uh, may or may not may or may not come out like by end of this year so if some some grid solves a few use cases um we will probably get someone to kind of talk about grid uh sub grid use cases a bit more like hopefully before the end of this year so stay tuned uh box model again like i mentioned right css2 Chapter 9 is like all the display stuff. So they now we've also picked up the box model section and put it in its own document. So it actually become very short. So it only covers margin and padding. Because some have been moved to the CSS display module. Display module is, is very long and comprehensive. Basically it covers everything, all the values. Huh? When you say uh, your, your selector is display X. So all the different values, you have block, you have inline, you have flex, you have grid, right? It all goes into the display module. So that module is actually quite big. Um, but the box model part of it is, has been taken out. So it's sort of like the visual chapter of CSS2 split into three parts, which is box model, uh, display model, and, and a few of the layout modules. Uh, scroll snapping is a thing. Uh, if Thomas Thomas Gorison was here, he would have opinions on this. But basically, you can do scroll jacking uh, natively with CSS instead of JavaScript. Uh, it's still being worked out, but actually there are use cases for this, especially on touch screen. So if you are like, you sort of do a maybe slideshow, then you halfway, if you do a halfway, it will not stop halfway, it will snap either to the front or to the back. You can do that with CSS uh, using this. This It's not a candidate recommendation, so it might be coming out quite soon. Uh, values and units very important. We use a lot of CSS units. Most of us only use pixels, m's, and maybe percentage sometimes. But there are a lot of other units that you can use. 
until got level 4 so there's like VI, VB, IC, CAP, LH, R, LH I don't even know what those are but those are new so if, if you're interested you can go and find out a bit more I think there are some articles on these level 4 uh, units already and a few of uh, mathematical functions actually min and max are, are pretty good because what they allow us to do is they allow us to do more flexible things like we can define ranges and things then they have updated cup to be more versatile than it was before so that's great uh, last one is logical properties and values so this is more relevant if you do if you are other than the default horizontal left to right because on like most if you read English all the text flows like left to right top to bottom but if you switch your verti your writing mode to say Arabic is right to left or traditional Japanese then it's vertical the physical directions get a bit confusing when you're doing styling so they introduce these logical properties so instead of physical values of top bottom left right it goes like block start or inline start that kind of thing so it's like culture agnostic directions okay we are done uh, you are sick of me now so we shall now introduce our official speakers um, they are called the Linuts because it's Chris, Chris's wife Sarah and Chris's son Elijah so known as the Linuts uh, going to be talking about a very uh, interesting topic so I will let Chris introduce his family moving on hopefully interesting topic at least do you need the whole thing? Uh, yeah. Okay. Ask Sarah to speak into the mic. Yeah. You can get the microphone. Oh, one angle? Uh, it gets recorded. <laughs> oh, okay, no worries, because I'm, I'm Sarah, quite loud. how much code do you write? None. I looked at that and went... Mm. <laughs> 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 okay, so we have a round of for the Linux review. Elijah knows how to write Swift, so he's following in my footsteps. He's the one reading at the back. He's all good. <laughs> Sarah is a primary school teacher. And you might be wondering why a primary school teacher is going to talk to you about anything uh, that's got to do with CSS or front-end dev. Um, and the reason Sarah's here tonight is because she recently studied... Huh. Hey. Hey. <laughs> she studied Kirby. Um, <laughs> she studied... Uh, as a teacher you need to learn about learning difficulties in students so you can address them and hopefully correct them as they go. Um, and while Sarah was studying into the details of dyslexia, um, she started telling me stuff that was really interesting and I thought like, this is really relevant to what I do. Um, we should do something at Talk CSS about that. So several months later, here we are. <coughs> um, you happy with the lights staring at you? Or yeah, would yeah, you yeah. prefer to be over here? Um, okay. That's fine. Yeah. Thanks. That'll make me make if it a bit you, easier. If you're a regular Talk CSS attendee, and you've had anything that's been baked, <laughs> this is why. <laughs> Hope you enjoy it. So we've brought the baker along. <laughs> I don't just bake. <laughs> I am a full-time teacher. Mostly bakes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Shall we talk about language or shall we go straight into... Well, let's have a look at dyslexia and how it might affect uh, what you're doing more than anything else. Okay. Dyslexia in the English language is uh, 1 in 10. It's quite common and it's across uh, a broad range of, of a spectrum, basically. So these people will not only have difficulty reading what you put on your web page, they'll have difficulty understanding and it will take them time so lots and lots of text can be very, very overwhelming and very difficult for them. One of the key things that Sarah learned about dyslexia is it varies from one language to another. Uh, what, what is dyslexia exactly? Well, it's a neurological disorder that, we, that uh, they think is genetic mostly and it affects the pathways in which we think, so the processing of words, the processing of information. It's also <coughs> affecting your uh, organisational skills as well. So it's quite a lot of things to cover. It makes it very difficult to read, makes it very difficult to comprehend. And if it's not uh, addressed early, it can be really detrimental for your later life, especially with comprehension and reading. So how do you see dyslexia in a student or in a person? 
Like how is it obvious that like when you see someone, what are you looking for to diagnose? We look very young. So um, Elijah's age is a, is a good age. He's, he's seven here, so you can have a look around the ages of six. And they know earlier now that they can look at um, brain imaging and they can see when they ask them questions to how to read or how to say something, they can see the pathways aren't quite correct. So we can now diagnose it really early, which is really, really wonderful. But we might look for um, difficulty reading words. When they start to read, it can take a long time. And I'll do something with you in a moment to get you to get an idea of how it might take somebody a long time to read. Uh, with their writing, they might start reversing letters. They might miss letters that are quite obvious, especially in English. English is a really hard language to be able to read, to be able to write, to be able to spell, makes it very difficult. So especially in the English language, the reversals of letters, um, which order they go in. We also look at their organisational skills. Can this child uh, turn up to school on time? Can this child go to the next class on time? So at a very young age, we can look at those things. What is it about English that makes it so difficult? English is not a very transparent language. You think about uh, the way that you spell a word, um, the word to, T-O-O, T-W-O, T-O, pronounced exactly the same way, three different ways of spelling, three different meanings altogether. Uh, it makes it really hard in that it's not what we call a transparent language. Where if you think about Malay, I uh, don't know how many of you have a bit of it. We should do when we, we catch the MRT, we see, we see all the language. We can pretty much look at the letters and go, oh, it says this and we can say it. Whereas the English language, it could mean something, or it could sound completely different to the way it's written. Is it, is it the word fish? You can spell P-H-O. Oh, this is an old, this is an old phonographic. Yeah, it makes it. Um, you can explain this. Uh, when was that, during the 80s or 90s? It, well, no, we're going a long or way back. Older. They got influenced by the French, they got influenced with Latin and they brought all different languages in. So it's just a big mishmash, the English language. And but we all know that it's, it's a hard language to learn. Which one? What's that? Brendesibus. <laughs> <laughs> but there was a movement at one point to encourage kids to spell however they feel like because expressing themselves was more important than um, actually getting the spelling right was the theory and the example was given for the word fish you could spell it p-h-o-t-i because you have p-h the f sound and you have o from women and t-i like function like that's a sh sound so isn't that how you spell fish and not really so it didn't really carry on very well but that's the difficulty of the english language it's not easy to learn it um, out of curiosity, who is not a native English speaker here? What was the first, first language, language you learned as not English? And hearing in your house, your mother tongue yeah. language. Not yep, not English. Lots of you. How did you find learning the English language? Brendesbus. <laughs> <laughs> when you gotten over that? <laughs> especially when it came to coming into school and writing it. How did you find it? Anyone? Ridiculous. Yes, it is. I can't spell anything. I, I can okay. say the words, but I can't spell them. Mm -hmm. My mum is an Italian, and she learned English as her second language in her 20s. And when she used to write shopping lists, the spelling was just, we used to look at it, what, what do you mean? What do you mean, was? <laughs> is. And she reads widely, but she has difficulty still spelling those words out. And it is hard. The English language is incredibly difficult and full of ridiculous rules. Makes it even harder when, to teach. When we talk about dyslexia, you said one in 10 display signs of dyslexia. Yes. Um, is that the same in other languages, like no. in Mandarin? Nope, no, uh, the English language in particular. Other languages, not so much. It depends on the transparency of your language. Uh, I was listening to, when we got together with this particular course we did, a lady whose mum was Italian and she'd never heard of dyslexia in her 40 years of teaching. So it depends very much so on the language. If you're finding English harder than you thought it should be, this is why, really. Mm, sometimes. <laughs> Partly not, why. It might, it might not be, but the English language is hard in general anyway. So it's rated as a difficult language? Very. It's, yeah. it's opaque, yes. Okay. Um, you mentioned before like, with your mum that she can speak really well, but when it comes to written language, she has difficulty. Mm. Um, is there something in dyslexia that... Like what, what's that got to do with anything? Why is it so difficult to write and to read well, compared to speaking? When 
people with dyslexia, um, what we do is we uh, take all the tiny bits of the English language apart and then we make a word. Most of us can just go straight away, that's the word that we can read. Uh, they have to, what we call decode basically, every single grapheme, um, the single letter, put it together, try and make sense of what that word is. We have direct access paths. Once we've read a word a few times, we understand immediately that's what the word is and we have that direct access to that word. It takes a lot longer to process those words when you have dyslexia. The uh, pathways are a lot longer. It's just a lot harder in general. Can I? Can you have your exercise? Okay. Can you please pair <laughs> up with somebody? And you need. <laughs> you are now I know it looks a bit frightening. Can you please pair up with someone? Someone who's got a timer, like basically on your on your watch or on your phone. Yes. Can you grab a partner for me? <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm very interactive. I'm a teacher. <laughs> Have you got your exercise? Or yeah, your yeah, yeah. Are actually No, I've got it. Show it when we're paired up. Yep. Who's not in a pair? Yeah. You're not in a pair? We'll pair up. <laughs> okay. So, can you nominate someone in your pair to be a timer and somebody who's going to read some words for you? <laughs> <laughs> it's not hard. It really isn't. Um, don't don't stress. It's it's. I do I did this with six year olds. So. Quite all right, and then I'll explain. Yeah, don't, don't worry, it's okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put um, a list of what we call irregular words, words that we can't spell by looking at them very quickly, or um, yeah, in words that don't sound the way that they are written. It will be okay. Um, and I want you to time how long it takes to read through that list. So read them out loud to your partner, and we'll have a look and see how long it actually takes. You ready? It's not a race. <laughs> Okay. It's shush. It's not okay. <laughs> Is it coming up? Oh, it's uh, not on. Screen. Which other screen? You've got two screens. Oh, mm. I'm not good at these things. We can just mirror. <laughs> <laughs> yep. This is this is not it's my thing. My one contribution. I can use Apple TV in my classroom. That's about it. Ah, good. Okay. Here are your words. They shouldn't be a little, little bit smaller than that. It's okay. Are you ready? Can you time, set, go? Okay, do we have some times? I heard a few times as we were going around. What did you ha what did you get? Twenty three seconds. Twenty three seconds? Fourteen point eight. Fourteen? Yep. That's what I would expect. Seventeen? Good. Ten. Whoa, fast. Fast decoder. <laughs> Fast decoding, that's fast decoding skills. That's, that's what we want, really. We want to be able to have that quick access anyway. So, um, Elijah was, I had two students who I did testing on. Elijah is six, he's just set turned seven, and he read it in 30 seconds. He's a very strong reader. Um, so I would expect you guys to read it in about 20, 30 seconds, which is good. Another student I had who had great difficulty reading, same age, took four and a half minutes. So we, she would get to a word like shoe, and she would go sh o e and she would go through each individual letter that she went through and it took her a long time four and a half minutes to do this entire list yes she's a beginning learner yes she's a beginning reader but these words aren't they're not the same that we don't um, pronounce them the way we read them the word because you could pronounce that several ways it gets harder and harder with things like height h e i g h t my goodness that's not the way we would expect to pronounce that. So people with uh, dyslexia or even uh, reading difficulties have a great hard time sitting there and reading every individual word. And then they have to try and make sense of what they're reading. So can you imagine taking every single word and trying to put it together and comprehending what you're reading? When you're 
doing your um, your coding and when you're putting things on your um, web pages, you need to be aware that there are people who have reading difficulties. So lots and lots of content can be hard. We do have ways around that, which is really, really wonderful. We'll get into a demo of that oh, okay. soon. Um, you said that you try to diagnose this in young kids when they basically when they start reading around six years of age. Yep. Um, if you never get diagnosed, if you don't have a teacher who even recognises it, what happens? It gets. Do you grow out hard. of it? No. Or what happens? No, it just it gets harder. It gets really hard. You can imagine your everyday life things that you have to read and how long they would take. It's exhausting as well. Mentally, it's exhausting. So you are tired. You don't want to read. And that's when we get a lot of problems later on with our kids, especially in like the older years. So yeah, how, how do these people do in school then? Not very well. A lot drop out. And that's, that's a reality for us. We and have that reality. It, I hate to say this, but is it because they're stupid? No. Um, people with dyslexia are actually quite intelligent. They've found usually they're average or above average in other areas. So they are very intelligent people. It's not... It's, the way their brain works, but we can do a lot with it these days and there are lots of different techniques that um, different dyslexics will use. Not one thing works for everyone, some things work for some people and it's a matter of finding with each individual what it is that works for them. Can I demonstrate the thing? Okay, okay. <laughs> so Google are fantastic in what they've created. Um, They've got this wonderful thing up here. Is it up there? Yeah, it is. Read and write for Google Chrome, which is wonderful. We think of um, text readers out there as something for people who are, are blind and they can't, they can't see what they're doing. This is also for dyslexics to be able to, um, to read what they, they've got in front of them. So this is a Channel News Asia thing. I, I like reading my news. And it will... This has got sound? Nope. But it will, <laughs> it will read it for you. It will highlight it. Oh. oh, we do have sound. Shh. Gardens by the Bay oh. set to light up the skies as it celebrates the Mid Autumn Festival for two weeks from the 6th of September to the 24th of September. So it reads it to you. We talk about that, that that's, that's great for people who are blind. But yes, and it take, did you notice it took things like sept and it read it as September, which is really, really helpful. Um, another thing that they found can really work for dyslexics is taking, and this is something I do in my classroom, is taking the um, content and making it so it's a nice, just a small chunk so they can understand. So they have a screen mask, so you can highlight sections. Just that bit to understand, just that bit to get through, and then you can move on to the so next what, bit. What is it about this that helps? It breaks it down into something that's a lot easier to be able to to read and to comprehend because you've got to understand what you're reading as well. So I guess it's easier to focus on that particular chunk of text yes. and you won't be distracted by everything else that's there. Yep, that, um, this helps for particular certain people. Um, I know it's helped for one student I've had, it didn't help for another. So it depends on the person really. The other things that it does, let's see if I can get out of here. The other things that it does is it gives you a dictionary. If I look up the word autumn, let's see if it will do it for me. It'll give me autumn, uh, which is a lovely one to be able to read, but more words than anything else, it will also give you a picture dictionary. Is it going to give me one for autumn? Yep. So it gives me your head's annoying. <laughs> it gives you a nice picture of autumn, which is great for young children as well, but it also makes it a little bit easier for them to be able to understand what the word autumn means. Uh, one more thing that it does, where is the simplify? I'm still learning to use this one myself. Uh, where's my simplify gone? Ah, simplify page. You talk about this more than I do because I didn't quite understand when you were talking about the things that aren't quite done oh, yeah, properly. The characters. the characters aren't quite Can done properly. Can you spot the subtle difference between what we had there before? Um, the whole point of Simplify is it's similar to reader mode in uh, browsers like Safari. Um, it takes away as many complications as possible and as Sarah is showing, you can actually reduce the amount of content on the screen at any given time. It's also, is it a sans serif font? Um, this is probably less obvious. If anyone was paying attention, they do flip the fonts as well. Apparently more common sans serif fonts are preferable for people who are dyslexics. So if you have a site with lots of crazy fonts, it's just really difficult to try to, to interpret. Not everyone has this. 
Um, so especially when you've got body text, you need to think really carefully about what you're doing. Um, and Sarah's course that she studied recommended 14-point Arial. Um, obviously, there are more fonts than that, and there are better ones than Arial. But the, the text size is important as well. Um, we talk about this in, in practice of good design generally, that you don't want your text to be too small. Um, dyslexia is a very good reason why you don't want that. The other thing is contrast. Uh, contrast is one of those other things that helps. Some people find it easier to read the white on black. They have other contrasts. I find this quite garish, but it works quite well for some dyslexics, the different colours. So um, in the classroom for us, we might print on a different coloured paper depending on the student. And probably if you've heard beforehand, they used, some used to wear glasses, coloured glasses, and that used to help some people beforehand, but it depends on the individual. Yeah. One thing that's not working ideally here, I wonder what an impact that has. Typically when we design text, we try not to go beyond I think it's 80 to 120 characters or something. 50 to 70 for English. Okay. Uh, in terms of width, because it's harder to comprehend. If you start reading here and you get to the end, coming all the way back is difficult. I imagine that would impact on dyslexics as well. Some, once again, some. Or is it better this way? Some. Okay. Some work better on a small screen, some work, some it doesn't affect it at all. It's just the length, yep. not so much. Yep, it's what's about comprehension again, keeping it, yeah. keeping You'll it small. You'll notice perhaps that there are some characters that have not been entered correctly, special characters that haven't been handled. Um, so whoever's working at Channel News Asia, if you know someone working on their team, please encourage them to uh, fix their, their characters. We use this, we're trying to get this used in our school um, because we found it really helpful for those students who do have those learning difficulties. Yeah. Um, we have gone through type, contrast. Now, animations are something that we see on websites. How do they impact on people? Or dyslexic we, or have reading difficulties? Well, it's a distraction because we know that people who are dyslexic have difficulty with organisational skills. It's another distraction. I don't know about you, I can't stand 50 zillion animations on a page. Um, can be a sensory overload for some people as well. So what, what's the sensory overload mean? What's that? Too many flashing lights, it can affect the way that you think. It can shut some people down. So they'll basically not even function? Yep, can get to wow. that. Not as much for animations. dyslexics. <laughs> Unless you're careful about them, which is what we, we talk about as good practice anyway. But the next time that someone's pushing for autoplay video, oh. this is why. You can actually stop someone from functioning and put them into a ball in the corner because of your autoplay video. Thanks. Um, Generally not with dyslexics though, that's looking into more things um, that, yeah. Uh, yeah. <coughs> You talked about simplify, simplify, simplifies the, I'm saying simplify a lot, the display. Yes. Um, something else that affects dyslexia is we saw the word list that we had before, they were the complex words. Yes. So how can you improve your copy to help? I don't know about that so much. Uh, we have lots of words in the English language, maybe not too much. Well, something I've seen before, I think, Zell, who's a almost like our third member of Talk CSS, published something recently about simplicity of language. Um, trying to avoid complex phrases. And um, can we find anything in here that looks complex? It should be written well since it's written by a journalist. It's okay. But you, yeah, even just being careful about your phrases. Um, something I've seen before is avoiding abbreviation, abbreviations. So if you've got its or theirs or something like that, as in there is, spell it out and it's a lot easier to comprehend because you don't have to think about whatever else is going on. This helps your readability of your content for people who have English as a second language. It helps people who are dyslexic as well. And given you know, if you're actually delivering content in English, it's all the more important that you focus on that. Um, when we were talking about this, we talked about forms, filling out forms, which everyone loves, right? These forms are so cool. I've seen so many from Chris, it's <laughs> <laughs> quite funny. Um, does, 
dyslexia have any impact on that? Yeah, this is back to organisational and comprehension. Keep it simple. Really keep it simple. As my Year 5 teacher had the KISS method, keep it simple, stupid. Keep it really basic as much as you can. People don't want to be trawling through all of your information. So in effect, it's basically everything that makes us not like it, but magnified. Yeah. Is that a reasonable way of Yeah, it? that's a good way. You just imagine being so, you know, at the end of the day, we are tired. We are all tired. You imagine that after reading for five minutes. It's quite exhausting. Awesome. Yeah. Do we have any questions? <laughs> that's okay. Is, is this an extension or is it... It's a it's Chrome a extension, like yeah. It's paid as well. There's We've, a 30-day demo. Which you've got. But it's a paid thing. Yeah. My, yeah, our school's getting it. We're investing in it because we found it so helpful for our kids with reading difficulties. But it's a, um, if you do have reading difficulties, it's a wonderful addition to Google. It makes things a lot easier. Yeah. It's one of the difficulties of a lot of accessibility tools that they cost money because they cost money to develop. Um, and for a long time, things like screen readers, like you had to buy a screen reader. Now there are things like VoiceOver and Safari that are built into the browser, so it's not so difficult. Um, especially as a developer, like, do you want to justify spending a subscription on this to your boss so you can test this out? Uh, good luck. <laughs> Anyone else? That's great. I think Wait, think most of what is done by the extension could be done as part of the website technically most of it done, yeah right? you could offer high contrast modes as you see on some sites that would be very helpful yeah that would be really helpful but this, this is the thing i found curious about this topic is um as someone who is quite passionate about accessibility generally we think about people who have difficulty reading either because they're blind or um like their eyes are fading so many of the things that we apply for that work for people who have difficulty reading because their brain is wired differently. And this is just not something that we usually talk about very often. It's just something to think about. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> for your first and probably only ever talk CSS talk. I talk to kids. I'm not very good with adults. None of our passports. Any nuts. Thank you. And the library is <laughs> and our our next speaker is William. William has spoken at Talk CSS before, so he's like gold member. Is this your third time? Uh, yeah. Yes. Man, you almost asked. Gold member. Go member. <laughs> so anyway, um, William recently published an article on Smashing Magazine, so he's like famous now. So we want him to remember us when like he makes his millions. But basically, when you get a website and then you scroll very enthusiastically on your phone, and then it hits the bottom of your phone, there's this irritating boing at the bottom. So basically he went through a whole lot of research to how to or how to take care of this over scroll bouncing effect. Yes. Also read his article on Smashing Magazine. Support. Support local guys. Round of applause please. Thank you. Let's start. Um, uh, 
Um, just a quick update, I'm currently working on a casual and educational game called Larry Knight and there's a website for it. Uh, so, what is scroll bouncing? I'll, I'll show you a demo of what it is. So this is how this is how you would expect. Um, this is how I expected my app to scroll like up and down, and you'd reach the bottom. But a few months ago, I and this this will happen a lot in a lot of websites, I think. Uh, a few months ago, I saw my app do this. When it hits the top, it bounces back. But the biggest problem is that there's this white space at the bottom when you scroll down. And this is not what I, this is not good for my users, I, I thought at that time. So. I spent a lot of time trying to get get this white thing out when you just get this stop just stop this bouncing um, and let's go to the next slide and um, so scroll bouncing is undes undesirable if you don't want you to see fixed elements on a page move. So in my example, in the example I gave, I didn't want my footer to move up and down and show you that white space at the bottom. I, I just wanted it to be fixed at the bottom and uh, just for it to stay there. So I'll like, show you again. Like, I just wanted this, this, blue, this blue footer to stay where it is, not, wait, not, like, not like up there, but like down down there. Uh, there are a lot of things you can try. I, I spent quite a lot of time on this. I'll, I'll just leave it. I'll just leave it. Uh, like, um, and basically what I, what I ended up with is uh, um, these two lines, uh, over scroll behavior none and the footer I left as position fixed. Like if, if there's any, if you, if anyone here can come up with something better, I'd, I'd be very, very interested to, to, to know that. But um, after all I did, I, I ended up with those two lines. There were, if you, if you read my article, there are a lot of things I did and that, and even the things inside the article, like that wasn't even, that's not even like, um, I think, I, I, I just basically did a lot more than, than what I showed in the article. Um, so, so that's basically it. Um, um, the browser compatibility for major browsers is um, like Chrome is supported, Firefox is supported, Opera is supported, Edge is coming soon, Safari, no support, Safari, please. Uh, and uh, one last thing I want to say is, uh, don't be afraid to start coding. So my color website, it's, it's quite bad, like in my opinion. Um, but I built it a long time ago, just for practice, just to convert colors and to remember colors to use for terminal, for terminals. Um, but it was more useful for something I didn't expect it to be used for. And uh, that's that's it. That's Can you it. share some of the examples that you went through that didn't work properly? But this is so. It's really you shouldn't. You, you probably shouldn't go through those examples. Okay. That that's that's the issue. But I mean, I I I I wouldn't mind. Sure, but sure, <laughs> it's like, oh gosh. Why is it because Apple do their own? The thing, yeah, Safari, Safari acts differently from Firefox, Chrome, and Edge. I think and it it keeps. Uh, I'll show you what it does on Safari. <laughs> I don't, like please, browsers, please, Safari, please. So what it does, it it still bounces 
which is which is not what happens in the other browser like which this like, this is not what happens in Chrome. Chrome it just you know you scroll up and down it stays stays put. Safari uh, this is what it does it it's it's still no matter what like no matter what I try it still acts a bit differently. I can't I can't fix is this a browser I, I can't <laughs> I can't fix this one. Is it a browser bug or, or it's, it's supposed to write it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure this is. Yeah, it's a, it's a it's, it's browser. I, I, at this point, I think it's browser. Like, it's, I, there's nothing, I, I, there's nothing I could do. This is why I, I am open to like, like, I, I'm happy to, to know about how. I don't, I just don't think, like, Safari is just doing things differently, and for for this particular case. Safari is just acting differently um, yeah, on iOS like, also. Uh, in a web UI, you, you do encoding in Xcode. Um, so this is what a web view does in uh, either Mac OS or iOS. But you get that bounce as part of the view. So it's not even something that the browser, like your CSS can't even interrogate that. Um, because it exists out Yeah, there. yeah, yeah, it doesn't affect. Yeah, you can't change that using CSS. Yeah, you're correct. Yeah, yeah you're correct. I think Safari were the first ones to do it properly with the iOS. I think they introduced this is why I they I think they introduced the bouncing. So so Apple introduced this bouncing behavior. But right now they seem to be the ones that are a bit lagging behind I think. Um, they used the support uh, disabling the bounce pre iOS ten. Okay. After iOS 10, they removed that function from Safari. So they have for oh. you enjoy bouncing. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but, but you, you might like like pull to refresh and things like that. So that's why you yeah. might want it. Um, but in my case, like, like people want to probably use the bottom thing if they ever use my app. Or, or any other like app you might come up with. They might want to use the bottom part and not have it you know, like white space at the bottom. Um. Any questions from other people's? I think, sh should I show the, should I show the article? Article, article, article. article. <laughs> I, I don't, what's the internet? <laughs> what's the? Zero X T A one L 50 up. Zero X T A one L fifty up. Fifty up. Okay, I'm scared. Uh, um, there's some. Oh gosh, don't. Uh, I'm sorry about this. The animations on this, like Chris was talking about the animations earlier, like. But I have to. I think I feel like that. I have to show. Like, there's there's even worse. Uh, I like. There's some even worse. I had to just take them out because there was one flickering effect. You don't want to get to that stage. Just use, you know, those two lines I, I just showed you just now, just use those two lines. Something while you're talking about animations in this context, these are okay. Apparently, yeah, if yeah, you this. do suffer from dyslexia, the chances are you will not be a programmer. Because learning more than one language, a programming language is a language. Um, so learning more than one is something dyslexics really struggle to do. So yeah, like I, away, like like some people, I, I had a feeling that some people would look at this article and then just just see the animations and then <laughs> like just close 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 my article. Okay, since we are talking about excessive animation, uh, since you're already here, right? Okay, more specifications for everybody. So there is uh, so and this is actually introduced. This actually came out from the WebKit team. So there is a 
So like there are a lot of levels for CSS specification. So media query has gone up to level five. Um, so level five. So most of us use media query very boring. We'll say oh media query we. But actually there are uh, like I think eighteen different uh. What do we call like properties you can put in as the as the query. So like color orientation height. And one of these is like reduce motion. So this was pioneered out of uh, WebKit, uh, Apple's team. So they talk about vestibular disorders. So it's like if some people when they see too much animation, then they just hint, and then like they just like close their website because hint. So like don't do that. Um. So everyone, we are all just temporarily able. Yeah. Maybe you'll develop a tumor. Oh, I love this article already. Um, or maybe you'll just get older. So, 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 yeah, it's, it's something to keep in mind if you are, especially if you work in agency. I used to work in agency, right? Then, like, the designers very on about, like, fancy animation. So, 10.1 introduced this, uh, it's media query level 5. So, down, 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 motion is wonderful until it's not, blah, blah, blah. Where's the actual code, my god? Oh, okay, okay. Prefers reduce motion. That's the that's that's the query. Uh, yeah. So, is this the okay? That's my as well. Maybe they realize that their own advertisement made people he. Then they have to introduce a media. Oh wow! So Apple, such an Apple way to do it. So. Okay, so this is the original, apparently, and this is... Okay, so they just no animation, like no, none of those funny zooming things. Okay, what's this? Okay, this, 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 this zooming thing is apparently not good. So... Oh, apparently they also updated their website. They must have gotten complaints. Yeah. So anyway, this is the this is a new media query that you could potentially use. Uh, media queries that I find quite interesting because other than this reduced media query, there's also like something related to light or like how many people use Windows machine? There's like this high contrast thing. Wait, let me see. Uh, media query level 5 Contrast Yeah, I think uh, light level Yeah, this is really like fresh and new It came out, it, it's like May So mm, Not standard Not standard, quite new uh, So it's in discussion But what light level does You have like dim, normal and wash So What does it say? Uh, definition of light level Someone explained this to me, but I can't remember. So, fine, light level. No, it doesn't exist. Dash? Oh, because it's in level 5. Light. Oh, okay. Detecting ambient light level. Oh, so when the device is dim, you can, you can trigger it to be brighter. So it's kind of cool. It's like, then your app can really be like responsive, not just responsive to the screen but responsive to the environment. So I think it's quite interesting because it's under a new category called environment media features. I don't even know what environment blending is but it's, it's, it's very new, they only came out already this year. So it might be quite cool, stay tuned. Yeah, web is fast. Anyway, um... Should I continue or...? Are you finished? Do you have more to say? Uh, I think they, they can see the website okay, by themselves. Sorry? Yeah, I'll, I'll just go. Okay. I'll just scroll down. Wait, I, I don't even. What did you <laughs> uh, Anything interesting? Probably the lines of code, like already, like this. This I tried a lot of. Uh, I guess it's not a lot. It's it's more it's several lines more. Um, some weird things happened. More lines. I think I, I think I think I think I think scrolling touch please. 
I think I think it might be actually if they actually in, I, I'm not I don't I don't quite remember uh, <laughs> wait. oh it allows momentum based scrolling then I have to explain momentum based like momentum based scrolling is like let me show you momentum it's based really show if using also it. like you swipe uh, and then it will continue uh, scrolling right so no like, no uh, just just no. this 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 is enough like Safari this like you know this I, I don't know if uh, Android does this as well if you guys have iOS phones this is momentum scrolling so you scroll like that and then um, if you don't have momentum scrolling this is what will happen like it, this is usually what happens it scrolls slower without momentum scrolling so momentum scrolling allows you to so momentum scrolling is like accelerate like like the, the acceleration and the deceleration something like, yeah something like that the flick the, the flick effect yeah. like oh, okay. flick up and down that's momentum scrolling so that's uh, so so I thought if they if they added um, if they added um, this and made it a feature that was not being deprecated I think I'd still be okay with it I think it might be a good feature to add but I, I haven't like I was just when I when I wrote this it's just to save developers time so they don't have to go through what what I what, what I went through which is a lot of days you know, thinking about this. Um, I think that one's just going to live there as a Safari implementation. When you need it. Keep is there a very I think time? I think even Safari doesn't even support it. Like, like no, I I think Safari. So so I wouldn't be surprised if Safari just didn't support it. Um, wait, I might have written something about that. Does not uh, appear as a property on that. Yeah, it doesn't even. <laughs> Uh, Firefox and Chrome recognize it, but Safari doesn't even like it doesn't even accept like like have it on the inspector. Oh, that's weird. Um, but I th I thought with regards to this, I thought it would be nice to this. This so basically Safari allows momentum. Not desktop. No, I've done I've done testing for both and even Android as well. What it says. <laughs> what, okay. what MDN must be wrong. MDN what? says uh, Safari. Yeah, uh, yes, it might, it might, but it doesn't. I've okay. I've done the I've done the extra I've done the extra testing for you guys. So just tr guys, just just trust me. Just just hit this uh just over scroll behavior to none and position fixed. And that's how you create your headers and footers. And that's that will if you want your fixed headers and footers, just use these two lines. Um there are other, there are other, um, there were other ways I used to do this before. Like I used Bootstrap Sticky Footer. Mm. Uh, that was actually that was actually good. It it did things that other footers could not. But once I saw this, like this is this is how I will, this is how I will make my headers and footers from now on. So uh, that's why I'm also interested if <laughs> anyone can find find anything better. But one interesting thing is that this. Um, this CSS property was only introduced in December 2017 in Chrome and this year, this year March in uh, Firefox. So it's quite new. So that's, that's the interesting thing about this. Um, but position fix is, has always been the same. I've heard some weird things but, um, about position fix, but I, I mean, I'm using it now. It seems to be okay on all my 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 like human testing, uh, and you know, I, um, actually I wouldn't. Uh, yeah, just just actually don't don't go through the article. Just <laughs> if you don't don't read the article. Just just read the just read the conclusion. <laughs> just read the conclusion. Like to to take a shortcut, uh, un unless you guys are really interested in seeing what other people have have done because these are other people these are like all these examples is like other people have done have spent at least spent some time doing them many like different types of other people and I've gone through all of their work and there's even one one person who built a, a whole library on this and there are like several com contributors to that which is <laughs> which is great which was probably great at the time uh, when this CSS property was not 
So there's like there's like nine contributors, fifty three commits, and What's that, Java? In, instead of two instead of two lines of CSS code, right? There is one hundred thirty. This is this is not the worst I've, but this is not the worst I've seen. But one hundred thirty seven compared to two is like, it's like I, I recommend you guys take the shortcut if you are doing web development, which which this will help you, which which um, this helps in I guess. Um, Does the JavaScript solution work for mobile Safari? I think it's 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 uh so f from my experience I think it's o it's okay good good um it's quite good and especially when overscroll behavior was not around I think it might have been a good solution I'm not entirely sure about this but right now I would just skip all of this right and just you know <laughs> just go uh position fixed overscroll behavior none But I think I did the comparison between this library and my my solution. There was basically no difference from human testing. I don't know if you're going to test like maybe some random, some obscure phone browser that only a few people use. I don't know where. I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. Um, something different will happen, but. Uh, uh, this basically does the same thing as what, what, that, that the the lines I show you that do. Uh, so I think, I think we should end it. Okay, end it. no more questions. Okay, one more round of applause for Ilya. Okay, we are making good time, everybody. So um. Okay, does anybody have any announcements? Anybody looking for a job? Anybody looking to hire people? Looking for jobs? Please, always for announcement. Do you have, okay, announcement. Okay, so. Can I can I use a brand? Yes, please. Okay.